Have you been made to feel crazy by trying to get insurance reimbursement for lactation services? Or are you a lactation provider who goes crazy trying to get reimbursed knowing that it is supposed to be a provided service according to the Affordable Care Act? Today, I'm going to do my best to demystify what is going on in insurance land when it comes to lactation services and lactation support, knowing that it is very complicated and it varies from state to state and that the answers to these questions are always changing and that I am no expert, but that I have done my due diligence to try to understand this very complicated issue to the best of my ability. And this is really just to have a conversation. And I would love to get your feedback on your experiences with trying to get lactation care covered wherever you live. So please join my Milk Making Minutes community group so we can talk about it. And with that, let's get into it. When I began breastfeeding, I was blindsided by how difficult it was, having known only a handful of people who had ever done it and only seeing it up close a couple of times, I had a huge learning curve. Since then, I've become a doula, a childbirth educator, and an internationally board certified lactation consultant, or an IBCLC. I'm your host, Lo Nigrosh, and I welcome you to the Milk Making Minutes where we explore the systemic medical and cultural barriers that make feeding our babies so difficult so that you know your baby feeding struggles are not your fault and your triumphs really are the miracles you feel they are. We just need to begin with the basics, which are that lactation care by law, should be covered. (laughs) That does not mean that it happens. But according to the Affordable Care Act, this is what it says. Most marketplace plans must provide breastfeeding equipment and counseling for pregnant and nursing women. You may be able to get help with breastfeeding at no cost. Health insurance plans must provide breastfeeding support, counseling, and equipment for the duration of breastfeeding. These services may be provided before and after birth. This applies to marketplace plans and all other insurance plans except for grandfathered plans coverage of breast pumps. Your health insurance plan must cover the cost of a breast pump. It may be either a rental unit or a new one you'll keep. Your plan may have guidelines on whether the covered pump is manual or electric, the length of the rental, and when you'll receive it before or after birth. But it's up to you and your doctor to decide what's right for you. Your doctor's breastfeeding recommendations. Your insurance plan will often follow your doctor's recommendations on what's medically appropriate. Some insurance plans may require pre-authorization from your doctor. That's what the law says. In a future episode, I'll cover what getting coverage for breast pumps looks like because I actually have some experience with this in a couple of settings. And it's interesting to see the misinformation that people have about this. So we will get into that some other time. But today I would like to focus on getting lactation support, getting the care you need, because as we know, and as you hear week in and week out on the Milk Making Minutes, breastfeeding, human milk feeding is a learned behavior. And if we have not grown up soaking in that learning for most of our lives, then when it is our turn, we most likely will have difficulty or at least a strong learning curve. And in the past, the 
people that helped us get over that learning curve were relatives, close friends, and many of us still rely on these people. And I value this peer support. And I encourage people to use that peer support. And because the art of feeding our babies was lost for a few generations, or we nearly lost it for a few generations, there is a lot of misinformation about feeding our babies human milk that does get spread by peers. And so if someone is really struggling to feed their baby, it is really important to go to somebody who has trained in both the art and science of lactation and who is able to both take what we know about the physiology of human milk making and understand the bigger picture of what could be happening with you, but then take your individual situation and help you come up with both short-term and long-term solutions that match your individual family's goals. And that would be most likely an IBCLC, which is an internationally board certified lactation consultant. Now, there are a lot of barriers to becoming an IBCLC. So sometimes there are other providers like a CLC, which is what I was before I finally got my credential to be an IBCLC. And so I did see people not very regularly in a private practice, but some as a CLC, but I had a lot of opportunity to counsel people when I was employed as a CLC by a breast pump distributor locally who also provided lactation counseling for all of our clients. But I was very aware of the places where it was outside of my scope or where I thought the person that I was talking to was better served by seeing an IBCLC. So I would often refer out to other people. And then there are people who are certified breastfeeding specialists. That's a CBS. There are certified breastfeeding counselors. There are lactation education specialists. So there are all sorts of credentials. But really, IBCLC is the gold standard. But the language of the law is very ambiguous about the wording of who can provide lactation services. And because IBCLCs are not licensed in most states, they are licensed in four states, in Georgia, New Mexico, Oregon, and Rhode Island. So in places where they are licensed, it is easier for IBCLCs to get in network with insurance companies. But what happens is because they aren't licensed, many insurance companies will then decide that they will not allow IBCLCs to become in network. And so if you look at the various ways that insurance companies try to wiggle out of coverage, which they do because insurance is a for-profit business. So what they are trying to do is obey the laws, but still maintain their quarterly bottom line. And so even though paying for breastfeeding support and human milk feeding support has been shown to them time and time again by health policy experts that the long-term financial benefits to them would far outweigh what they would pay in the short term for breastfeeding support because we know that when people exclusively breastfeed and are supported to do that and feel good about it, then long-term costs, medical costs, reduce both for the feeding parent and for the baby. So they are shown these statistics by health experts, health policymakers, but what they care most about is meeting their quarterly numbers to show investors and to show 
shareholders. They're concerned about their short term bottom line and it doesn't matter to them as much the long term profitability of any policy decision that they make. Therefore, it is much easier for them to follow the letter of the law than to provide this coverage. So there are some insurance companies that allow IBCLCs to get in network, but it is the insurance company that decides the payout. So sometimes they will pay close to or above the private practice IBCLC's rate for a visit. And sometimes they pay far below. And then an IBCLC is forced to make the decision, do I accept this payment that is far below what my rate is that helps me to be able to do this work and still support my family and hopefully take on more clients because I'm now in network with this insurance company or do I stick to what I know I need my rates to be in order for it to make financial sense for my family. Because lactation visits, they are not the 15 or 20 minutes that you see a doctor or many other providers. They are 60 to 90 minutes typically. And so these are long visits. And it's not just the visit itself. It's the driving to and from the home if it's inside of your house. And the charting takes a lot of time because for every patient, we are required to chart, especially if we are in network with an insurance company, but that's just best practice for any medical provider. Then there's the care plan that we send to the patients in addition to that. And many of us send very detailed care plans. So it is a lot of time that we're devoting to each patient. So the payout needs to reflect that, but we don't get a choice in what the insurance companies pay out to us. We just have to accept what they decide. So many IBCLCs, because the payout is so low for insurance companies, will decide no, I'm not going to become in network with that insurance company because they cannot pay me enough for me to be able to support my family's needs. And that is really sad for the people who need support and for the IBCLC. It's so hard when you work in a field that you are very passionate about and that makes impacts on people's lives, yet there is this barrier to the people you want to serve getting care, but you still have to make wise decisions financially for your family. It, it makes it so challenging to make those decisions. Last night, as a family, we had the rare opportunity to just have one child at home. We had not eaten dinner yet, and it was getting pretty late, but we asked him, it's just the three of us, what would you like to do? And my son said he wanted to take a walk at a nearby reservoir. And neither my husband and I were stressed out about this because we had a refrigerator full of feast and fettle, which had delivered home-cooked meals right to our front door that We knew when we came home from our walk, all we would have to do was just heat and serve it. So off we went on our walk right around sunset, around the reservoir. It was beautiful, just the three of us and our dog. And then we came home and within 15 minutes, we had the most delicious coconut crusted cod and roasted cauliflower and we ate it while we played Uno together, and the cleanup was so easy, and it made our evening so amazing after a full day of work and allowed us to connect with our child. And this is why I am so happy that Feast and Fettle is a partner of the podcast, because I truly believe that anything that allows families to spend more time together and less time worrying about all the things they need to do, like getting dinner on the table, is something I can get behind. So if you would like to see what Feast and Fettle can do for your family, go to feastandfettle.com and use 
my code M-I-L-K to get $30 off your first week's order and let somebody else do the cooking for you and just go take that walk. Some insurance companies actually don't even have a network of lactation providers. So IBCLCs or lactation professionals cannot even get in network. So one example that I have seen in my own state is Blue Cross Blue Shield. So Blue Cross Blue Shield typically does reimburse patients, I will say, for IBCLC services. But if you don't have the money to pay up front for the fee, and you're trying to just have your insurance company pay up front, they won't allow IBCLCs to get a network, but they're required to have a list of providers that's required by the law that you can go to. But if you go to the list of providers, none of them are trained in lactation. They're all MDs, NPs. So those people are billing the codes for lactation services when you go and ask a 15 minute question and they give you an answer based on what they've seen in their clinic over the years, but it might not be the evidence-based information that you would like to get. It's the same as asking your aunt or your cousin because they don't have the training of an IBCLC. They get three to nine hours of lactation specific training in med school. It's really not equitable care to not have a list of IBCLCs, but the way they get around this is they say that IBCLCs are not licensed by the state and therefore cannot get in network. And then the other thing that we see is that insurance companies impose major administrative barriers on the people trying to get coverage. And so As anyone who has ever fed a human baby, human milk from their own body knows, sometimes it's urgent to get the lactation care. And so if you have to jump through three or four hoops to try to get preauthorization and figure out what the reimbursement is going to be and figure out who the providers are that you can go to and wait two to three days every time you make a phone call, it might by then... uh, not be too late because you can almost always recover from whatever lactation difficulty is happening. But by that time, the train might already be moving in another direction. And then you have to work harder to get back on your original plan. And anyone who is in the postpartum period knows that needing to jump through any extra hoops to get the care you need means you might not. You might just say, this has become too difficult. There are too many barriers. And I would rather just have peace and not have to fight to get the care I need. And I'm going to change the plan. And then sometimes they impose restrictions. So they'll say, we'll cover one visit or we'll cover two visits. And as many people know who have fed babies, sometimes you need more than that to work out any kinks that are happening. And sometimes it takes a few visits with somebody to get to know the situation or a step-by-step plan. So you can't always work on everything at once. Maybe you start off with a nipple shield just to get baby latching, but then in a few weeks, we're going to come back and we're going to try to figure out how we can, now that baby is getting the milk and has learned how to suckle at the breast, now we're going to figure out how we can start taking actions to remove the nipple shield. One of the reasons insurance companies are able to do this is because they use a clause in the law called reasonable medical management. Under this regulation, implementing the preventative health services, insurance companies are allowed to use reasonable medical management techniques to determine the frequency, method, treatment, or setting for which a recommended preventative service will be available without cost sharing requirements to the extent not specified in a recommendation or guideline. So they'll use this clause to say we're using medical management right now and we are determining that we don't have to cover this service without cost sharing. So what does this mean? for the average person trying to get lactation care. Here's what I will tell you about what you can do practically. 
I recommend that you figure this stuff out prenatally. If you are devoting a lot of time to setting up the perfect nursery, getting all the onesies washed and folded and cleaned, finding all the bottles you need, picking the perfect breast pump, which by the way, there's no perfect breast pump. And it's really how you use the pump that matters. There definitely are pumps that are better than others, but this is widely variable and each person is going to respond to each pump differently. You could ask 50 different people, which is their favorite pump, and you're going to get 50 different responses, really. And so you spend all this time and energy on all the stuff prenatally. And if you could just take a fraction of that time on dealing with the insurance company, figuring out who you're going to go to for your private practice lactation support, and then also knowing who your peer supporters are going to be. Finding the local peer support group, whether it's run by an IBCLC or it's run by a hospital or it's run by a baby cafe or by La Leche League or Breastfeeding USA. Find both avenues, both your professional support and your peer support because both are so important. And figure out how you're going to get your insurance to pay, whether or not they are going to pay up front or whether or not you will need to pay in advance and then get reimbursed. If you are not able to get reimbursed or pay up front, which is really common if you have Medicaid, add an area to your baby registry for lactation services and have people donate cash so that it is there and it is ready for you. There's no reason not to get people to pay for this support if you really do want to breastfeed because support is the thing that differentiates people who meet their goals from people who don't meet their goals. And we see that play out again and again in the studies. So spend at least as much time on setting yourself up for support in the postpartum period as you do on the stuff. Figure out who are the list of in-network providers. And if none of them are listed as IBCLCs, then figure out how you get that paid for. So for instance, in my state of Massachusetts, um, IBCLCs can get a network with Aetna and Humana and United Healthcare, with Unicare, with Tricare, and with Fallon. And then also many lactation providers choose to contract through the lactation network, which basically they are the biller. They provide their own national provider number and then the lactation consultant provides the services and then gets paid by the lactation network. What it means for the people providing the lactation services is that it is just a very easy way to know that you are going to get your lactation support paid for and the insurance companies that are currently contracted with the Lactation Network are Blue Cross Blue Shield PPOs all across the country, Humana PPOs, United Multiplan, and Provider Network of America. That's a great way to get lactation care if you happen to have one of those insurance companies. And then you can use something like zipmilk.org. They're in, I think, maybe 13 states. So you can see if they are in your state to um, put in your zip code and check with IBCLCs close to you to see who they are contracted with. And then of course, you can always ask your insurance company if you can choose your own provider and ask any lactation consultant that you end up working with if they will provide you a super bill to submit. And you can always, even if your insurance company tells you they're not going to pay for something, you can always submit a super bill and they may send you a check. I've had that happen for things that I was told would not get paid for and it ended up paying out, even for quite large 
services that I had in the multiple thousands of dollars. So it's worth trying, even if they say they're not going to, because sometimes it's easier for them to pay than to fight you over a period of time. So that's worth trying. If this is something that really gets your goat, (laughs) there is advocacy work that you could be doing to help. So some of the places that you can do the advocacy work with is the United States Lactation Consultants Association. There are places to, to be an advocate as a parent and an ally, or you can go to your state's breastfeeding committee. Most states do have a breastfeeding committee and ask how you can be an ally and an advocate on the state level to, because most of this is regulated state by state to get better insurance coverage so that the people who come behind us are not struggling so much. Now, if you live outside of the United States, I would love to know how lactation support is working if you would like to get private lactation support somewhere else. So please join the Milk Making Minutes group and tell me how it's going. If you live in Massachusetts or Connecticut, or Rhode Island, or New Hampshire, and and you are spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to get coverage for things that your insurance company should already be paying for, then why not take something else off your plate by going to feastandfettle.com and getting $30 off your first week of home-cooked meals delivered right to your front door. You won't regret it, and you'll get some time back. And with that, I'll see you next week. Bye.